right. We left off talking a, a little bit about regulation. This is the Or is it going to be one more technology challenge for them? Okay, we're back. All right, guys, we're not. It seems like if I move the mouse, like so, I'm going to have to, to touch this thing repeatedly to keep it moving. Anyway, uh, in terms of the regulation, uh, we had we had a couple of acts that, that helped us in terms of the stock market. Uh, keep our, our markets regulated. The first was the Securities Act of 1933-34. We left off talking about this stuff, guys, because we were rounding off our discussion of the stock market and securities. In 1929, the big stock market crash started something really big in this country. What did we call it? The Great Depression. Absolutely right. And one of the big responses to this was basically to have more regulation so that we could not have another crash in the markets. Then we uh, ended up having something called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. And guys, what that came out of was also the dot-com bubble. And we also had the Dodd-Frank Frank Act. I want to talk about this for just a minute, even if the screen goes dark for a second. Let's talk about what drove 2008 and what we can learn from it today. We know, for example, our last big market crash was 2008. What's causing the markets to be a little unstable or volatile today? COVID, because we're all curious about whether or not we're going to have jobs, how soon the economy is going to recover, all these things. Well, 2008 was a little different, guys. What happened in 2008? Does anybody know? Yeah, the housing market. Mr. Parker, what can you tell me about that? In terms of uh, what It was like a house of cards. Yeah, very good. How many of you, I know, I know uh, Mr. Parker and I have been talking about this, but how many of you have seen the movie The Big Short? If you haven't seen it, it's all about how the markets crash. Here's what happened, guys. Essentially, what's the biggest source of wealth for most Americans, guys? It's not our savings, it's something we own. What might it be? What's the most expensive thing we invest in? Our house. So our house is our big source of wealth. Our house is where we put all of our money, what we are talking about upgrading, we're putting money into our house all the time. So what happened in 2008, a lot of people who probably should not have gotten loans, got loans. We have people who had very high risk loans. When a bank takes your money, when you're paying your mortgage every month, they're not just keeping the money in their, in their vaults, they're investing. They're putting it into global markets, they're putting it in other places. So let's see if this pen works today because the technology is failing us. Hopefully the pens will not. We have people like you and me. And every month, we're paying our mortgages, our hard-earned dollars, to the bank. When you put money in the bank, even though it's minimal, what does the bank give you back if you have like a savings account or a checking account? What do you earn? You earn interest. So we're, we're putting money in, in terms of savings. We're putting money in, in terms of, you know, checking accounts. And we're also paying our rent and our mortgages. What the bank does is invest this money in other places. It could be the stock market. It could be bonds. It could even be things like property. And what happens when this source of money dries up? All of a sudden, there's a ripple effect and everything else dries up behind it. So we are a consumer economy. We're a capitalist economy. And as a result, when we're not putting money back into the economy, the economy starts to contract. And when people quit having money because they, uh, they for example, were not getting paid, it was a cyclical process. Some of the people who were being fed by this money weren't able to pay their mortgages, and it spiraled. If you're not able to pay your mortgage, you're probably not going to buy another car. If you can't buy another car, you're probably not going to buy luxury goods. In fact, the only thing that really went up in value in terms of, of people buying stuff during this period, believe it or not, you can, I remember this too. This would be a good bonus question. What is the one type of product, or name me a type of product, that actually increases in sales when the economy gets back? Gas does sometimes. 
That's a good one. Yes. Toilet paper, for sure. I wish I owned Sharon and Charmin. I'm thinking something that maybe is even a little more self-destructive. What am I? What might I be thinking? I'm sorry. I have a pants now, does it? Because I'm talking. Booze. Absolutely right. As Homer Simpson once said, "Ah, yes, alcohol, the source of and solution to all of life's problems." When people are having a bad time, they sometimes like to drink. And even in the most recent recession that we're in. Alcohol sales. By the way, does anybody have a guess? In the month of March, between March and April of this year, how much did alcohol sales overall in the United States increase? We got a guess for 25. Let's go higher. 65. How'd you know that? It was That's the number, man. Well done. So we're talking about people basically who increased their drinking by 65%. I myself am not responsible for the whole percentage, but I did my best. It comes down to the idea that, yeah, sometimes vices still sell during recessions. So that could be a good, a, a really good bonus question for a later time. But we're going to do our best to see if I, if, if by keeping the mouse moving, uh, even though it'll be distracting, I, I can keep our, uh, our presentation moving here, guys. What we're going to be talking about in this particular session is how you can own a business, the different types of business ownership. Let's think about that for a second, guys. We spent an entire chapter talking about ways you can finance. Who here can tell me, in terms of business ownership, what is one way that people can own a business? Yes, sir. Sole proprietorship, you own the whole thing. Is there another way you can own a business? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can own a share of a corporation. We can all own a corporation. And somewhere between the corporation and the sole proprietor, we have a, we have a partnership. So two or three people might have a partnership. Generally speaking, when we get to three people, we've got a company. But those are different ways we can own a business. We're going to be talking about the advantages and disadvantages of those setups. So what are our outcomes for this particular chapter? We're going to talk basically about what the advantages and disadvantages are, how you can become a public corporation, how hard it is, why companies merge, and what kinds of trends are affecting business in the, in the long and short term. You guys out in Zoom land, too, what I'll be doing from, from here on out, I'll be also publishing the slides. In fact, for you guys following along at home, the slides are under Chapter 4. You can, you can download those as well. Yes? Oh, they're not. By the, next, by the next time we get out there, they will be. I apologize if they're not out there. I just uploaded them this morning. And uh, technology, apparently, today is not my friend. But hopefully we can make amends. But that's okay. Sometimes there's a technology problem, and sometimes you punt. That does not keep us from having a good time together. Am I right? Can we have a good time together today, guys? Yes, yes, we can. Well, somebody tell me, if you were thinking of starting a business, what's one that you would think would be a great idea that you'd say, sign me up? What's one that you wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole? What's a business that you would want to get involved in? If you were an investor, it could be a partner, it could be a part of a company. What's something you'd be interested in? Yes, sir. Oh, that's a good one. Why? Yeah, we can have access. Bad things happen. It's perpetual. It's a good business to be in. Who else has a good business or a business that they would want nothing to do with? What's a business? You guys are all business majors. What are you interested in? What's a business? Yes, ma'am. So you would want to be involved or not want to be involved? Because I agree with you. Why is that such a great business? Almost always goes up. Now, we're in a complicated time for real estate right now with everybody migrating to home work. But I think it'll come back, too. What about, are there businesses you wouldn't want involved? What would be a business you would not want to touch? How many of you want to start DVD rental stores? Yeah, what a, what a great market that is. Let's see, what else, what else would be a good business to be in right now? How many of you want to invest right now, for between here and the end of the year, in a bar? Yeah, bad investment in short term. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, I was going to say, when we were talking about like, the great competition in New York, that would be uh, Kent's Chicken Shack. Kent Tonkin's Chicken Shack isn't going to do good no matter what. It could be the only restaurant around for 50 square miles, and I think we'd have a hard time just with a name like Kent Tonkin's Chicken Shack. Nobody's coming. I need a marketing consultant to help me come up with a better name. 
So there are other businesses, guys, that you wouldn't think of that are always sure things. I know this sounds kind of morbid, because one business that always succeeds, and there's a funeral home. They always succeed because people, for the history of time, have not quit dying. True story, this, this would also be a good bonus question, too. My family doctor, his wife is a mortician. So his, his, he's basically told me when I've come into his office, one way or another, we're going to get you. I think there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there, personally. But so far, he hasn't tried to kill me. He's a great doctor. But there are lots of reasons we get involved in the business. Now, guys, right now we're in the middle of something that some people are calling a retail apocalypse. It's COVID, man, and we were already having trouble before then. What kind of stores, what kind of businesses have been struggling even before COVID? J.C. Penny, it's like that's that's the ultimate grandmother store, isn't it? Yes. Wow, man, that's that's like one, one, two, three strikes, you're out. Seriously, uh, we, we, traditional department stores are having a hell of a time. Why is that, guys? Yes. Yeah, guys. By the way, we're we're, we're in the busiest shopping time of the year. I can't even conceive of what the numbers are going to be. If we go one year ago, Amazon, one company in the United States, one company. For $4.50 of every $10 spent on the internet. One freaking company, guys. If you're JCPenney, how do you compete with that? Even Walmart is facing a challenge in terms of how you survive against this stuff. Here's another company that made me sad when they closed, but it made sense. How many of you have fond memories as little kids going to Toys R Us? How many of you were sad when it closed? It's like a piece of your childhood just died. Now it's a spirit Halloween store half the time. It's like, it's terrible. It's like it's being reincarnated as a zombie version of itself. But why did Toys R Us go under? Tell me more, because you're absolutely correct. No, no more board games, no more dolls, no more action figures. Kids are getting cell phones and iPads more quickly these days. That phenomenon is called uh, age compression. We're seeing more of it all the time. I, it makes me sad for kids who are growing up these days. They're not going to have a childhood about that stuff. But that's why they're closing. I love this, by the way. There's an entire series of web pages you can find that are pictures of dead malls. This is like watching the 1980s melt down in front of my face. How many of you have watched the show Stranger Things, by the way? Yeah, this is the mall that they hang out at. It looks kind of like that. But the world is changing. And so the, the way that we buy and, 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 and uh, shop is changing too. Instead of doing this individually in small groups, we're going to do this together. I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to be presenting you a company. And some of them are real companies. Some of them are hypothetical companies. I'm going to ask you, if you were starting this visit, business, what are the tough parts and what are the good parts about your business? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Would you take on partners or form a corporation or would you stop where you are? How big is your company going to get? Are you going to have private ownership? Are you going to issue stock? Where are your areas of risk and how do you deal with them? Let's talk about these companies, guys. So the first is we have Kawasaki Motorcycles. Very close to my heart. I love Kawasaki. I ride one myself. Guys, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being Kawasaki Motorcycles in 2020? What would, be a, what would be an advantage? 2020. Yes. You're absolutely correct. Like, uh, if you bought this bike brand new, this is a few years old, but if you bought a brand new Kawasaki motorcycle, something equivalent to that, you're spending between six and $12,000. You can buy a really nice used car for so a niche, that's number one. That's a challenge. What else is challenging about being Kawasaki Motorcycles in 2020? How many of you guys have friends who have motorcycles? A couple of you. If I had asked this question 20 years ago, about half the room would have raised their hands. They're becoming less popular with people who are younger for lots of reasons. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you it's a safe habit. It's a dangerous habit to be in. Here we are in Pennsylvania, guys. How many months out of the years can I conceivably use this thing? If I'm lucky, 
maybe five, maybe even half the year. But it, it's a niche market. Here's the other part of it too, guys. It would be very tough for a, a, a personal owner to have their own motorcycle company because you couldn't produce volume. There's a reason why Kawasaki is a diversified publicly traded company. They make all kinds of things, guys. Kawasaki Industries makes everything from motorcycles to guitars, and in some countries they even sell cars. They have to operate at a large scale to make a go of it because they've got large amounts of overhead. So this is likely not going to survive as a small private company. Let's go to our next. We've got this uh, local uh, service, In the Weeds Lawn Care Service. Would this be more likely to be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation? Maybe a partnership, but sole proprietorship makes sense because, guys, what, what are the vulnerabilities of this business? And if, if you are not, if, you, if you're working a few months out of the year, what else are you probably going to be doing in the winter if you're these guys? You're going to be shoveling snow. And the worst thing can happen to you, and by the way, it's sort of happening this year. I'm going to make sure I'm addressing my friends here at the back, too. Uh, what's happening this year, we have this one-two punch where we had a drought. So the grass isn't growing, and we're probably going to have a dry, cold winter, too. That's a rough place for these guys to be. Unless you are going to buy up multiple branches and have some sort of national chain, having a big company probably doesn't make sense for in the weeds lawn care. What makes more sense is to be a small proprietorship, a sole proprietorship. And here's the thing, too. Let's say this guy has a wife. He might be relying on her for health care and a savings account if, that, if his wife, for example, works for a company that provides those things. So it's very vulnerable. Let's talk about another company. Here we got Smith Myers Store. Does it make sense for them to get any bigger than what they are? Why are they successful? Sorry? It's the store up in town. Has anybody ever been to Smith Mines? Yeah. Why are they successful up here, guys? It's it. It is the only store in town. And the thing is, too, for college students who don't have cars, if you need a gallon of milk or some macaroni and cheese, this is your only option unless you can hike a ride to Walmart. So it doesn't really make any sense for them to get any bigger. Their vulnerability, there's a certain time of year when the town basically evaporates. What am I thinking of? Summertime and it lives easy, unless you're in a small store. Because these guys have, are counting on college students. We've got one more. We have Frankie Francis Sports Management. This guy is like the Jerry Maguire for St. Francis Athletics. He's helping people get out of college, go out and get pro careers. Is this going to be a sole proprietorship, a corporation, a partnership? What do you think? First of all, what's it going to take for this business to be successful? you got to have quality athletes. What else do you need to have? What's this guy going to have to have to be successful? Connections. You're going to have to have a network. So I can see partnerships, for example. You can have several folks who all have different specialties. I'm, I'm connected to football. I'm connected to baseball. I'm connected to basketball. But in reality, if this gets too much bigger, it's probably going to have to stay small and flexible. We may even make it a limited liability corporation. I want to talk to you about what that means. So individual companies, based on their goals, have different ways they have to operate in different economies of scale. So, guys, in terms of how this works out, if you, if you want to know, for example, the largest percentage, the largest percentage of businesses in the United States are sole proprietorships. But corporations, for example, produce the biggest amounts of percentages of sales and, and percentages of profits. So big companies make more money. But a lot of great ideas start with small companies, sole proprietorships or partnerships. So again, a sole proprietorship, guys, could be anything. If I decide, for example, when I retire, that I want to open up my own guitar shop, and I sell two guitars a week, I still count it as a sole proprietorship. So a lot of small businesses get counted in these numbers, but corporations, and by the way, we're seeing a growth of mega corporations, the likes of which we have never seen. The very fact that we've got trillion dollar companies. Guys, when I ask you who are the biggest companies in the world, what are names that jump to the front of your list? Amazon, enormous, guys. I mean, we're actually talking about a nearly vertically integrated company. Does anybody know what that means? 
We say that a company is vertically integrated. What does it mean? Oh, you're, you, you're hitting on the, the hierarchy of business already. Yes. Not exactly what I'm referring to, but it's a good point. Let's talk about this for a second. Let's say, for example, I do form that guitar shop. And I want to sell a guitar to a customer, for example. Somebody's ordered one from me in Arizona. How do I get that instrument to them? I'm going to go down to FedEx, or I'm going to go to UPS, or even the post office, and I'm going to have it shipped. i got to pay somebody else to do it. How does Amazon ship stuff now? They're controlling their own shipping. They're controlling their own inventory control. They are controlling their own health care. They literally have folks who are getting uh, paid to, to give health care to their employees. Complete vertical integration. Yes, sir. So they're, were they actually selling their services? Yeah. I don't know that, actually. I've never been asked that question. I don't know, but I'll find out because I can see it totally happen. So, but that's my point. We've got Amazon. Who, who else, when you think of mega corporations, who jumps into your mind? Yes. Yeah, the biggest company that people just don't think about anymore. Absolutely. Who else? Yes. Yeah, that's if you want to secure drop off, you can have it set right there. And they're, Amazon's actually prototyping out electric delivery vehicles, so they're, they're going to start cutting the uh, petroleum industry out of their industry, too. And they're even developing their own uh, solar and wind power electric generators, so they're literally going to be a completely self-contained enterprise. Uh, it's, they're, they're making their own brands of clothing now. I mean, it's, it's amazing how big that company is becoming. I would argue, actually, let's see what you guys think. I know what I think. What do you guys think? If you had to say, you had to name one company that is the most powerful company in the world, who would you say it is? Who would be your pick? So we gotta, we got to vote for Apple. That's not a bad choice. Who else has a pick? In terms of the most powerful. we got Apple. Good one. Why, and by the way, why did you pick Apple? I think it's a very good choice. Technology and taking it to the end of the thing, and everyone's thinking about their product. You ever, you've seen the, uh, the Avengers Endgame movie? Yeah. It's like a fan of snapping his yeah. finger. Yeah, they can, they can slow down our data. So we got to vote for Apple. I think that's a strong candidate. Anybody else have a, have a, a company they would put up to the top of the list? I think Apple's good. Uh, I'm going to put my case for Google. Guys, how many of you in this room, when you need to find something on the internet, use anything beside Google? Yeah. How many of you go past page two for your search results? How many of you in the last week of your lives have used Google Maps for something? Yeah, it's amazing. Yes, sir. They, it holds a lot of power, doesn't it? And so when we think about how companies interact with a company like Google, they have quietly become one of the most powerful companies that's ever existed. By the way, here's a fun fact for you guys. Yahoo had the chance to buy Google for three, I think it was three or five billion dollars in the early 2000s. And they said it was too expensive. How would you have liked to have been the decision maker at Yahoo who decided they wanted to go cheap on Google? It's amazing how big these companies are, guys. It's big stuff. But we're going we're gonna to put this all in context here. I like that you're thinking about this stuff. And by the way, the fact that you guys are thinking about how to control your information and your own privacy, I absolutely love you thinking that stuff. Everybody should be concerned with their privacy. Guys, if you own a business outright, you got a sole proprietorship. If you're getting two people together, you got a partnership. If you get a corporation, it means you've got a group of people who have formed a company that has actually maintained a life of its own. Does anybody know who started Ford Motor Company? His last name was Ford. Do you know what his first name was? Henry Ford. Birth of the of automation and the and the manufacturing line in the United States. He very famously said, "You could have a Model T." Any color so long as it's black. Very good. By the way, here's, here's a fun fact for you guys. I'm going to expect it. Derek and Kobe back here. The average car in the United States 
So if all the vehicles were sold in the United States last year, what's the average gas mileage for every car sold in the United States? Well, how'd you know that? Very good. Which was a wild well, guess. That was really good. Because you know what the average fuel economy of the Model T was? 22 miles per gallon. So since 1918, we haven't really gotten any better uh, per mileage in our cars. The cars have gotten better. But Henry Ford, where I'm going with this is, this man's been dead for a long time. But yet his company is still around. Corporations exist independent of the people who, who start them, whether they are controlled publicly or whether they are controlled privately. Corporations are meant to last. Sole proprietorship won't last because if you're the only person and you don't have an heir, when you die, the business dies. A partnership will last a little longer because you have more people, but corporations are almost perpetual if they're well run. Let me ask you guys, don't even worry about what's on the slide, but let me ask you this question, guys. If, uh, if for example, you started a sole proprietorship, what's an advantage of a sole proprietorship? What would be an advantage? Yes, sir. You got the control for sure. Are there are other advantages. What would be another advantage? Let's hear from this other one. What's an advantage of a sole proprietorship? Yes, sir. Yeah, you just pass as an individual. Very good. Very good, man. Is there one other advantage? Speaking of money, yes. Limited liability. Depends how you set up, but it can be, yes. You don't have to worry about anything or anything. And just keeping all the money. You got it. Those are advantages. So, yeah, so in terms of control of the business, you have less regulation. You're generally not taxed any special way, and you have now liability can be a touchy issue. If you are an individual and you owe money to people, yes, they can come after your house, they can come after your car, they can do these things, but there's ways to set up as a limited liability corporation, even as an individual, you can do that. So the, the disadvantage is if you are truly operating as a sole proprietor, you do have what they refer to as unlimited liability. And that means if you owe they can sell your house to get the money. It can be tough sometimes to get money to start your business up. If you are a sole proprietor, you sometimes can work really long weeks. We're talking people who might be working 60, 70 hour weeks because you're getting your business started, you're getting it moving. And it's also tough because anytime you lose, anytime you lose money, it's coming out of your pocket. So that's some of the limitations of being a sole proprietorship. You get to be the boss, but as the old expression goes, you're paying the cost to be the boss. And that means, for example, when you lose, it's all on you. Let's talk about partnerships. If you were thinking about getting into a partnership in terms of a company, what would you be looking for in a partner? Yes. Oh, that is such a good answer. Tell me more. That could be, that's a, by the way, that's a powerful life lesson. It, it can be really rough to do business with friends or family. Why is that, by the way? Why is it so hard? That's a great answer. By show of hands here, who here has ever made the mistake of lending money to a friend? Who here has ever played hell in getting the money back? Yeah, why do our friends screw us on this stuff? It, it goes something like this. Well, they're my buddy, so I can pay them back at some point in time, and then you, they owe you 50 bucks, and the next week you see them with a new pair of Nikes, or they owe you 200 bucks, and the next week you see them with a new cell phone, or they owe you, true story for my life, they owe you 1,500 bucks, and all of a sudden they have a new motorcycle. It can be really tough. What are other things you would look for in a partner, though? Yes? You guys are nailing this today. That's a great answer. You want somebody who basically is strong in areas that you are not so you can complement each other. Fantastic answer. What else would you guys look for in a partner? Loyalty. Yeah, is somebody going to have your back or not? It's one of these things because if we avoid going into business with some of our close friends, although sometimes it works, you have to build that trust with people. Other things you would look for, guys. I'm going to give you some advice about starting a business that also applies to a marriage. 
Guys, I think that, for example, if you had to think about marriage in and of itself, what are the biggest fights in a marriage always about? What's the number one source of stress in a marriage? Money. You got it. Finance. Are we saving money? Are we putting money back? Or is there yet another string of boxes from Amazon.com on my porch? Not saying that's my personal life, but it is. So, well, my wife, of course, my wife is pretty I'm glad my wife doesn't subscribe to my YouTube channel. But seriously, it comes down to the idea of, is somebody going to be responsible with money? If you find somebody that you are in love with in your life, you want to make them your partner, or your wife, your husband, whatever, somebody who's not like you is going to be a good partner. I'm a terrible cook. My wife is an amazing cook. I'm not the world's most patient person. She's a very patient person. I'm not good and knowing how to sort laundry to keep colors from bleeding over. She's excellent at it. If you have somebody you're starting a business with, if they're great at accounting, and you're not, what a great combination. If you're great at creative ideas and writing, and they're not, but they're very analytical, and they're good at documenting things, that could be a really good business partnership. So yes, pick the things that complement each other, and figure out a way to get along. And here's the other trick too, guys, whether it's a marriage or whether it's business. You have to have the ability to talk to each other. If you cannot talk honestly with somebody, you cannot be forthright with them, you probably shouldn't be in a relationship with them, and you probably shouldn't start a business with them. That is my two cents on that. But we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of partnership, and then because we got started a little late, I need to cover our, our to-do list through the week. So we're going to cover that after we get through partnership because I want to make sure you guys are all good to go. In terms of partnerships, some of the advantages of partnerships, they're really easy. They're easy to get started. Uh, if you have two people, you have more money available. And again, diversity of skills. You're good at what I'm not. You're also not paying any kind of special taxes because you're not a corporation. It's very easy to get started. Well, some of the, the, the problems are, depending, again, how you set up your partnership, you can end up with what we refer to as unlimited liability. So if you're throwing your lot in with somebody who's not good with money, all of a sudden, their credit problems could become your credit problems. It's tough when we like somebody to have to have hard conversations with them. The conflict is part of it. And then we also get into the idea of how we're going to split the profits, how we're going to determine who's getting what. And when it comes down to ending a partnership, that can be really challenging for everybody. So guys, bear with me for a second here. I'm going to bring up our, our task list for the week because we had a little bit of a a weird start to things today. So let me bring this back up. I normally cover this at the beginning of class, but I'm covering it today. Guys, just a couple of reminders. Your rate of return exercise is due on the 21st. That's this Wednesday. And I went over it on Friday. Does anybody have questions about calculating a rate of return? If you do, uh, if, you, if you want, if you come to my office during office hours, I'll gladly go through our calculation with you again if you're confused on it. But the rate of return. Now, if you lose money on stock, remember, that's a negative rate of return. Let's check in on a couple of things so you get perfect scores in this exercise. Can you buy total, can you buy partial shares of stock? You cannot. Okay. When you divide for your rate of return, if you invested $100,000 but didn't quite get to $100,000, you're going to divide by your actual investment. Does that all make sense, guys? Okay. Your stock gain portfolios are going to be due on the 9th of November. So they're going to be due a week after, actually a week and a couple of days after the end of October. So I will be reminding you on that stuff, guys. If you haven't set up your handshake profile yet, please do so. And with that, I'm going to let you go a couple minutes ahead of schedule today, guys. Hey, guys, you are coming in remotely. Thank you so much. See you guys. Have a good day.